and, and among the oldest. It started in 1807, uh, the Episcopal Parish here in Washington uh, began this graveyard. Very quickly, they allocated 100 spaces to members of Congress, and it is why it is today. The illustration on the bottom right shows you those congressional burying places. The reason we're pausing to begin here is because what you see on the center slide, this is a list of the children of Jason and Jane Lynch who are buried in Congressional Cemetery. It begins with Jeanette, who lived to be almost nine, uh, George, who died before he was one, Laura, who died at the age of two, Mary at the age of three, James at the age of two, Charlotte at the age of one, and Emma at the age of two. Child mortality, the death of children from disease was so commonplace in the centuries before us that until the 20th century, the lifespan, the average lifespan of a person had was something around 35 years. In the 20th century, the average lifespan rose to about 45 years. What held this average down was the enormous destruction of children's lives by childhood diseases, diseases that we have subsequently learned to conquer, but up until the last century were completely out of control, swept through the population the way that poor Jason and Jane Lynch saw, uh, leaving dead children and great grief behind. The graph on the left, it's kind of an odd graph, I can, I can see. It shows you the history of pandemics. On the left-hand side is the name of the particular pandemic. Uh, in, on the right are the dates. Uh, obviously, we go uh, back from uh, long ago to the present. And the size of those bubbles give you some indication of uh, the death toll. And that's sketched out for you in the right-hand graphic as well. To update this, COVID-19 appears at the very bottom of this uh, pyramid on your left. You see it there. Uh, the current statistics are 3.4 million dead on the 19th of, uh, 3.4 million dead on the 19th of May, 2021, the worldwide death toll. This is swept in a little over a year and a half, or a little under a year and a half, through the world, uh, leaving horrific, uh, disease and deaths behind it. And it is the reason why we refocused our attention on the role that disease plays in history, the very significant role shaping history in many respects. Uh, COVID-19 virus uh, is scaling here on this chart. Uh, it's the top red at 3.4 million deaths, but it put it in context with pandemic flu, with the Hong Kong flu of 1968, with the Asian flu of 57, and with the influenza A virus, the Spanish flu of World War I uh, in 1918. Uh, that Spanish flu, and we'll talk a lot more about it as time goes on, killed somewhere around 50 million people uh, on the globe. It's possible to see numbers as high as 100 million, nobody really knows, but it dramatically altered the history, not simply of the period, but of the century. And these other uh, arrows will give you some sense of what came out. Uh, these statistics are today from uh, Johns Hopkins University. Today, uh, the impact of coronavirus, its distribution, 164 million cases, 3.4 million deaths, uh, a billion and a half doses of vaccine administered. And that'll give you a very quick look. The map below it gives you a very quick look of the distribution. Clearly, with a possible exception of the number of vaccine doses administered, the statistics on cases of the disease and the deaths arising from it are very, very soft. For political reasons, for statistical reasons, for all kinds of explanations, it's pretty clear that these numbers are lower than they should be. And uh, my suspicion is in deaths and cases dramatically lower than they should be because it is difficult to collect those statistics in the first instance. And in the second instance, there are real political pressures to manipulate those numbers the downward or to manipulate them in any case. But this is an, an update of where we are with this particular condition. Uh, some propaganda posters, so to speak, uh, talking about COVID-19. Uh, the politics of this are very complicated everywhere in the world. We are the beneficiaries of superb science 
in this century, in this, in this decade, and in this year. First, the fact that a vaccine, an effective vaccine exists to prevent the spread of this disease, the catching it and then spreading it. Uh, that's an extraordinary achievement. Nothing like that existed a century ago, which explains the terrific losses, the 50 million up to, up to 100 million in the last uh, flu epidemic. We have seen uh, successfully the development through an accelerated process, start to finish of an effective vaccine, several effective vaccines in the space of a little over a year. This is a fraction of the time it typically takes to develop an effective vaccine. And we are the beneficiaries of that. I'll talk a lot more about vaccine as we go on. Looking back though, what are the origins of disease? What do we know about it? Where does it come from? How do we deal with it? How has it changed society? In the beginning, it says here, in the beginning, disease was commonly believed to be an expression of the wrath of God. It was sent by God to earth to chastise, to punish, to correct uh, his people. And that role of for disease as a chastisement, as a correction, remained for centuries before anybody began to grasp any kind of a scientific or modern understanding of really what disease was. This uh, painting shows that uh, disease as the wrath of God. It's commonplace to ascribe the invention of medicine as Robin Lane Fox does here uh, in, in a very recent book uh, to the Greek uh, physician Hippocrates. Uh, there is a statue, a sculpture of a head uh, that might be of Hippocrates, uh, it might not be. All we know for sure about him is he was an old white guy with a beard and you'll see another old white guy with a beard in a minute. And if you glance at your screen, you're listening to an old white guy with a beard. But uh, medicine is typically thought to begin with Hippocrates, the movement away from the notion of disease as an expression of the wrath of God and as something explained by some other process, perhaps physical, perhaps something else, some other process. And Hippocrates is, is uh, attributed to be the first people who thought about that, although much of what he is alleged to have written now appears like he did not write. Uh, this may include the famous Hippocratic Oath named after him. You'll recall the phrase, first do no harm. Uh, it's not at all clear that he wrote that oath or that he wrote much that's attributed to him. The next position that continues the move away from the notion of disease as a visitation from the heavens is Galen, and those are his dates. Galen believed that disease was a kind of consequence of the imbalance of humors in the body. And these humors were four in number, black bile, yellow bile, phlegm, and blood. Black, yellow, white, and red. And it was an imbalance of these fluids, these humors, that created disease. All that's left of Galen's theory really is the expression that describes someone as being in good humor or being in bad humor. The notion of humor has persisted, but all the medical background uh, that Galen provided for it is long since gone. Broadcast Toro, uh, you see his dates there, it's a handsome painting by uh, Titian. Broadcast Toro thought that disease was a consequence of uh, microscopic particles, particles that were not visible, that he called spores. So you see the progression of thinking about what is it that causes disease? moving away from the notion that it's an expression of wrath and indignity and to something really quite specific that is somehow imbalancing the body and creating disease. For many decades, centuries even, the notion came that disease arose out of the ground, out of the swamps, out of unhealthy air, out of miasma. And this cartoon on the right shows you that exceedingly well. These miasma forms, uh, coming up smallpox, leprosy, uh, coming up out of the damp ground in a port city uh, to distribute disease. And the notion was if it smelled bad, it was a cause of disease. There's a little racist note there in that same cartoon. You'll see the, the miasma leprosy is holding a towel that says Chinatown. 
and the disease came from foreigners as well. The map on your left is a map of, of Batavia, the capital city of, of the Dutch colony of Java. Uh, and the reason Batavia was a commonly believed to be a sinkhole of disease, and it was malaria specifically, was because of the waters and swamps around that small capital and the rising smells, the rising miasma that came from, from that smell. Medicine starts to become more scientific uh, with the analysis by a famous British physician named James Lind, who on board HMS Salisbury uh, towards the end of the last century, the 18th century, 1747, conducted a very sophisticated experiment in an effort to understand what the cause of a disease called scurvy was. Scurvy was an absolute limitation on the health of sailors and on the length of cruises. After several months at sea, crew, crew members would begin to weaken, sicken, and die from some mysterious condition that caused open sores, teeth to fall out, uh, old injuries to reappear, complete debilitation, and finally death. If you look at the expeditions of Magellan, for instance, uh, they come home at about a third strength, all the other members of the crew were lost uh, due to scurvy. We now know it as a lack of vitamin C in the diet. Lind conducted an experiment with 12 sailors, six pairs of sailors, and he delivered to each pair a different medication, a different solution. It was the pair that he served up citrus juice to that survived. And that was the beginning of an understanding of scurvy as a vitamin C deficiency. Further in the progress of science against disease, Louis Pasteur develops the first, the most modern notion of disease as a consequence of germs. Uh, it is he who, his, na his name is given to pasteurization, a process that purified milk, which up until the beginning of pasteurization, early in the last century, was a source of terrific disease and fatalities among the young people of the world, especially in the United States, who drank milk that came from these uh, stable di diaries in town where the cows were locked into their uh, stalls and fed the waste from distillation plants. Not surprisingly, enormously unhealthy. It was Pasteur who developed the germ theory of disease and the process of pasteurization. Disease played an enormously important part in the ancient world in part because its sources were unknown, its consequences were clear, and because it came down so heavily on one side or another uh, during the course of, of those uh, classical centuries conflict. The plague of Athens was a plague of typhus, 430 to 427 BC. It sharply changed the balance of power, so to speak, between Athens and Sparta, its rival in, in the Peloponnesus. The uh, Justinian bubonic plague put terrific pressure under the Roman Empire of the 6th uh, century AD. That's a mosaic of Justinian. Uh, the map on the top right is uh, an illustration of the distribution of bubonic plague in that century. You will see that that distribution looks very much like the distribution of subsequent uh, bubonic plague outbreaks in Europe around the Mediterranean basin. The notion is that plague entered uh, the Roman Empire, that, that same uh, uh, epidemic that I just described to you, entered it through the port of Alexandria, then and since one of the five principal ports of the Mediterranean. And it moved throughout the Roman world, Mediterranean world, along these lines that reflect the shipping of the period. Disease up until this century traveled like everything else traveled long distance. It traveled by sea and ships, spread by crews, spread by passengers, uh, along with their cargoes. This is a, a distribution map of that particular epidemic of plague. Unusually, it centers on Alexandria. The next ones we'll see come from elsewhere. Bubonic plague, Yersinia pestis, is a bacteria carried in the gut of fleas. You'll see uh, that image at the bottom left. That is the, the uh, bacteria 
inside of a flea. And typically those fleas are carried by rodents, uh, prairie dogs, rats, often rats, even hamsters. And the origin points of bubonic plague are often in the grounds, the native grounds of, of prairie dogs and other rodents. It's not a surprising given the prevalence of rats in port cities and their access to ships that it travels by sea in the manner that I've just described to you. We tend to think of bubonic plague as something of the, uh, of the past. This map here shows you in the United States reported cases of plague 1970 to 2018. The red dot uh, indicates a case. Uh, this one in Illinois is uh, unusual because it, it was from a lab, not from natural spread. But the disease now is nothing like what it was in our history because we have cures for it, antibiotic cures for it. So the incidence is more a historical curiosity than it is the tremendous threat to life it used to be. The epidemic of the 1300s, the Black Death of the 1300s is the one everybody thinks about. Its origin was in the steppes of Russia, probably or possibly uh, finding its home or original home in the hamster populations in that area. It spreads through the Black Sea by ship, as I said, and then moves around through the Mediterranean over water and then over land carried by people uh, up into the British Isles and Scandinavia with uh, extraordinary death and destruction. It had some interesting consequences, not simply huge numbers of dying, but it strengthened the role of the church and it accelerated the decline of uh, aristocracy and the feudalism. Strengthen the role of the church because the church could explain the disease's origins and could provide some degree of comfort through ritual, through prayer, and through parades of flagellants moving through the streets, uh, this sort of thing. It affected the accelerated demise of feudalism because it changed the balance, the economic balance between labor on the one hand and land on the other. Labor became scarce because of the high rate of mortality as a consequence of the plague. Uh, land, of course, is a fixed quantity. And the result of that was to change the economic structure of society and to accelerate, people think, uh, the demise of feudalism. This is. This is Saint Sien's uh, a, a Black Death and the Dance, and it shows the intimate relationship that life had with death in the Middle Ages. So, not just in the music, but also in the art. This is a fragment from the Anthony Chapel, the Church, uh, uh, Church of Saint Nicholas in Tallinn, and what it shows you is the relationship of the skeletons dancing and of the prosperous the aristocrats, the wealthy of the, of the region of that era, dancing with them, the close, the intimate relationship between life and death that it was not spared, was not changed by your social status, your role in society. So a handsome painting uh, in that church. In the monastery of St. Anthony, is another painting that, that shows the extent to which Conditions and disease penetrated the thinking of people every day. This is from Grunewald's altar panel. Take a look at it in close up of the Christ. Of course, this is the familiar figure of Christ on the cross in the crown of thorns. But among the many indignities and the many terrors he's suffering, there are these strange rashes that, that appear on his body uh, as he suffers. Uh, this is new to that altarpiece. And what it's showing is, is the effect of disease on the body of Christ. Hieronymus Bosch, uh, another brilliant artist of the 16th century, also was painting death, disease, and the consequences of human infirmity. Uh, this is a painting of his from the early 1500s. Bruegel the Elder is hanging in Madrid uh, in the Prado Museum in Madrid, the triumph of death the armies of death swooping into society, into civilization, the armies of disease, 
And the consequences are, of course, what you would suspect. Disease and death will win, uh, the population will lose. The highlight, the center, there is, is death on its pale horse, that slender skeletal horse, death sweeping aside, herding people into the maw that you see in the middle while his armies move around. And the bottom left is the king surrounded by barrels of gold and his wealth and his status don't change anything. He too is subject to disease and death. The only people in this extraordinary image at the Prado that seem oblivious to what is happening are the two lovers in the bottom right-hand corner uh, whose, whose own death, whose own consequences will appear very, very soon. In the, at the end of the 18th century, Napoleon determined to continue his assault on the British Empire through the seizure of India. He launches a fleet to Egypt. The idea is they will sail down the Red Sea and proceed to capture the enormously prosperous, the enormously successful colony of British India and in such a way strike a blow, uh, a fatal blow perhaps on the British Empire. In fact, his navy is defeated at the Battle of the Nile. Napoleon will appear at the Pest House in Jaffa in March 1799, uh, noting the fact that bubonic plague has erupted in the Middle East, and he will use the appearance of the plague as an excuse to explain his inability to succeed in this first of two plans to capture India and to collapse the British Empire. Here is an illustration of plague during that subsequent next century, the 19th century, of its distribution, uh, either epidemic or endemic, as it says, in the second half of that century. And you'll see it spans uh, the entire globe. In the early years of the subsequent century, here are other distribution circles showing you the impact of plague. The distribution of disease traveled with people, uh, with their products and in their ships, as I described to you earlier. A great moment for that distribution is what's called the Columbian Exchange at the end of the 15th century, uh, beginning with Columbus, who brings with his ships, his three ships, the two halves of the globe together for the first time since they divided. Uh, many millennia before. And you'll see that beginning with that uh, first voyage of Columbus, there is an exchange of all sorts of products, people, cattle, uh, farm animals, farm products, all sorts of things, including disease, uh, specifically syphilis, smallpox, malaria, and yellow fever, where they have been centralized or localized in one or another continent they now begin to move uh, across the water together with the ships and the peoples carrying them. The reason syphilis is highlighted on the top there is because its, its movement is somewhat mysterious. The usual description of the tra transmission of syphilis is that it comes back from the new world with the ships returning, beginning with Columbus's return, and is carried to the old world, to Europe and the rest of the world uh, by the sailors uh, who contract uh, syphilis in the new world. That's not completely clear and we're not sure that's true. It might have gone the other way. But what is clear is smallpox, malaria, and yellow fever all go the other way. They move from east to west, carried by the ships and, and sailors of this new, new age. This is an illustration of the French army uh, heading for Italy after the return of, of uh, Columbus from uh, from the New World, and the idea is that French troops and, and artillery, French troops, uh, carried syphilis to Italy with them when they invaded, and it is for that reason that the Italians call syphilis the French disease. Everyone calls syphilis somebody else's disease because of the embarrassment uh, that it causes. In World War II, it was the focus of public health uh, projects, important public health projects in the United States. The fear was that, that syphilis and other venereal diseases would be brought back from the European theater, back to the home country, back to the homeland, and spread there. These are World War I propaganda posters. On the top right, it suggests we've defeated 
bubonic plague, yellow fever, and tuberculosis. And now what remains to control is venereal disease. At the bottom left, urges the doughboys returning to the United States to carry on the army's fight. It was a feature of the propaganda, I mean, venereal disease was a feature of the propaganda of the next war as well. Here we have caricatures of Togo, Hitler, and Mussolini thinking about, on the one hand, the benefits of venereal disease because American soldiers could catch it with ease, Togo says. But a thoughtful Hitler thinks it's possible that prophylaxis will prevent the disease and it will not have the desired effect. So I think this is a, an astonishing uh, poster cartoon that uh, shows you the place the disease and disease control played in the thinking of the post-war return. Smallpox is carried to Americans, to Native Americans, uh, in the ships and in the bodies of their crew, uh, to devastating effect. There is, of course, nothing like natural immunity to it, and the consequences on the Native population are extraordinary. Smallpox eradication is typically attributed to Edward Jenner, the British physician who discovers that a previous exposure to a disease called cowpox makes you immune. Uh, the history is much more complicated than that, much longer than that. China and Turkey had come up with vaccination, I'm sorry, inoculation, the notion that if you introduce a very small amount of smallpox pus under the skin of somebody who was not diseased, that it was likely that they would gain from that exposure immunity, having been exposed to this very tiny sample uh, threaded underneath their skin. That notion was returned uh, to the United Kingdom by a, a traveling uh, woman from the nobility, and it became uh, inoculation that became more or less common but it ran some risk because you were in fact introducing smallpox into a healthy body. Jenner's discovery that cowpox provides the same immunity and not the same level of risk uh, and the subsequent development of vaccination is a, a historic moment in the business of disease and the matter of disease in history. Malaria travels uh, to the new world uh, along those same routes that slaves traveled in some of those very same bodies. Uh, this is the distribution curve of that. Its eradication required the eradication of mosquitoes. The first, the recognition that mosquitoes distributed the disease, and second, control methods to do that. This rather odd map, top right, shows you the size of the continental masses as representing the amount of malaria that's present in those uh, in those continents. The cartoon in the bottom left, the Spanish cartoon in the bottom left, shows the DDT played a powerful role in the control of mosquitoes and the control of malaria. Malaria is still uh, out in the world today, although we have uh, me mechanisms to cure it, methods to cure it. The statistics for 2019 are up there, uh, 400,000 deaths out of something over 200 million cases. Yellow fever, another disease carried by mosquitoes, a different kind of a mosquito. One of the complications of, of uh, defeating mosquito-borne diseases, first, you have to realize that, that that's the case, that it's mosquito-borne. And second, there are, some mosquitoes are nocturnal, some mosquitoes are diurnal. So it's not enough to simply control them by saying by using bed nets, as, as you do in, in some cases, because it doesn't deal with the mosquitoes that are diurnal. The first recorded outbreak of yellow fever in the Americas, 1648, uh, that arrow shows you the distribution down there. The political significance of yellow fever is profound. Uh, there are historians who believe that the French effort to squash the Haitian Revolution in 1791-98, that French effort was defeated by the very high level of contagion of the French army with yellow fever. And Napoleon ultimately decided he couldn't win in Haiti. He withdrew the survivors of his army, leaving it to Toussaint Louverture, the, the native general, the native leader of the military resistance. And the consequences were 
that Haiti, for a brief period of time anyway, gained its independence through resistance against France. Napoleon's conclusion from this experience was that he would, didn't want to be in the new world altogether. Uh, he put Louisiana up for sale. And that act doubled the United States, as you know, bought it, bought Louisiana. That act doubled the size of, of the United States at the time. And both of these consequences, the, the defeat of the French in the Caribbean and the sale of Louisiana to the United States, both of these consequences arose out of the business of a very small mosquito uh, doing what it does. There was a yellow fever epidemic in 1793 that could have changed American history dramatically also. That epidemic was in Philadelphia. At the time, Philadelphia with a population of something over 40,000 was the second largest city in the United States. It was as well the capital of the new United States. The appearance of yellow fever on the docks of Philadelphia resulted in the uh, evacuation of about 17,000 of Philadelphia citizens. These citizens included George and Martha Washington and Alexander Hamilton as well. Think for a moment how American history would have changed had either of those three or others in that same class, in that same group, fallen ill and died of the yellow fever epidemic of 1793. Benjamin Rush, the physician there, whose painting you see in the bottom of the screen, published his, his pamphlet observations on the origin of uh, malignant bilious or yellow fever in Philadelphia and the means of preventing it. Rush was a physician of enormous status. He was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, for example. He was also completely wrong Everything he said about yellow fever, most especially his cure, which involved draining huge amounts of blood from the body of sufferers, uh, most especially his cure was wrong. Uh, Rush was an absolute danger to his patients during the yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia. It had a profound effect during the Spanish American War as well on all sides, the Spaniards, the the native Cubans uh, and the Americans who fought in Cuba uh, suffered much more from yellow fever than they did from, from the uh, fire of their opponents. Uh, these are some illustrations of a, a movie with Montgomery Devine about it, a painting by uh, Cornwall of the Conquerors of Yellow Fever, and a picture of Walter Reed, who is famous uh, physician, the army physician, who is as famous for his role in, in helping grasp what it was that yellow fever, what, what, what it was about the disease, how it was promulgated, and what could be done about it. The answer is about what could be done about it in that era was very difficult. At first, it required people to realize that, that there was a mosquito born. Yellow fever also had a powerful effect in Panama, as you might suspect, first upon the French attempt to build a sea level canal through Panama, which was a complete failure for many reasons, engineering among others, but also because they were very difficult to keep the labor force working in the face of the disease, as this sort of grim cartoon illustrates. The United States took over that project uh, some years later. It was a financial failure first before it was a, a medical failure. Uh, De Lesseps' son ended up in jail for a while. De Lesseps was a fundraiser and a politician. Uh, the business of constructing the Panama Canal was fair, I'm sorry, the Suez Canal he made his reputation. It was fairly easy. It amounted to moving huge amounts of dirt uh, and not much more. The construction of a Panama Canal across the isthmus, uh, up and down the mountains, uh, very, very difficult proposition, complicated enormously, as I'm suggesting to you by yellow fever. The French effort collapsed in the trials and all kinds of recriminations, uh, ultimately, uh, the United States built that canal. Ergot is another disease, one that we haven't heard much of, I suspect, but it is a mold that appears on rye grasses. There's an example of it there in the picture to the right, and it has powerful medical effects. Uh, one of them is it reduces fertility in populations who eat bread uh, infested with ergot. Uh, the other one is it's supposed to affect mental agility and uh, 
and it, it as well as enormously uncomfortable. Here is in the monastery of St. Anthony in Eisenheim, a painting of a sufferer from ergot poisoning. There he is on the left with his skin erupting. On the right, those wretched beasts chewing away on things uh, are the pain of the disease being inflicted on people. Ergot is also believed to reduce vitality, uh, physical vitality and mental acuity. Uh, this uh, painting of peasants uh, leaving the land, leaving the landlord. Russian peasants were commonly believed to be dull and dispirited and not particularly hardworking. And the consequence it was thought was the consequence of the poisoning from ergot that infested their rye, infected their bread, and affected them terribly. We don't hear much about ergot in the United States, although some think that the Salem witch trials were a consequence of hallucinations, the book down there in the witches by Stacy Schiff uh, is a really good story. Some think that the hysteria that attended, that triggered the Salem witch trials was uh, fantasies and mental problems arising from ergot poison. Typhus, another disease that commonly travels with armies on the march, uh, played an enormous role in Napoleon's second attempt to defeat the British Empire by seizing India. This attempt was he was going to march through Russia to the coast, to the southern coasts, and uh, obtain access to India that way. In 1812, Napoleon launches an army of almost a half a million, I think. Uh, heading towards Moscow. Uh, this is a picture of portions of that retreat. The march of uh, Napoleon's army to and from Moscow was famously illustrated by Charles Menard, this flow chart. And let me show you this red line here shows the march into Moscow. The black line shows the march out. The thickness of the line illustrates the size of the army, beginning with just under half a million, and at the end, uh, tens of thousands. Uh, they died from the winter, but they died from disease as well. And uh, that line sketches out to you uh, some, some indication of how much suffering, how terrible was the trip back from Moscow. In the bottom, there's a temperature scale that shows you the effects of winter on the course of this march. It's a, Impressive visualization, fascinating chart. There have been six cholera pandemics uh, since uh, the early 19th century. This is an illustration from New Yorker showing death stalking through the waters of London, and it, it's cholera stalking through London, and it's appropriately in the waters because it was finally determined uh, by a physician named Snow that. Cholera was not carried through the air or so some sort of miasma, but rather it was a consequence of contaminated water. This map shows you the distribution of the 19th and 20th century pandemics of cholera as they spread from their point of origin in the Bay of Bengal, initially carried by ships of the British East India Company, but moving along trade routes, overwater trade routes, into the rest of the world. The discovery that cholera was waterborne and not airborne and from some other sources is typically attributed to a London physician named John Snow, there he is on the left, whose statistical analysis of the incidence of cholera in the city of London led him to the conclusion that an outbreak of cholera in this particular neighborhood here was fueled by a contaminated water supply in a pump, a water pump, and that's the illustration on the left. That water pump was closely uh, connected to plumbing that ran right next to a septic tank, and that water supply uh, contaminate, was contaminated and created the fatalities or the disease and the fatalities shown in this map that Snow developed. There's a very excellent book about that, The Ghost Map by Stephen Johnson talking about John Snow's deductive powers. Cholera remained thought in terms of not the water supply, but something else for a long time. Death in Hamburg, a book by Evans, 
describes the 1892 epidemic of cholera in Hamburg, where the city uh, burghers decided that it could not be their water supply. They had just treated it. They decided cholera was still a consequence of the uh, discredited theory of miasma, something in the air. They concealed the outbreak of the epidemic. They left the port open. Cholera continued to spread. And that story uh, is told by Evans wonderfully well in his book, Death in Hamburg. The great killer of civilians in the 19th century was tuberculosis, this, uh, this painting of a man suffering through the death of his wife uh, is a dramatization of that. Uh, tuberculosis uh, shaped settlement, the Adirondacks, the recreation areas, the Adirondacks, the recreation areas on the front range in Colorado, all had their start as safe places to go for people with tuberculosis to seek a cure in the good air of the region. Uh, ter terrifically destructive disease. Uh, the book on that that I would recommend to you is Living in the Shadow of Death, Tuberculosis and the Social Experience of Illness in American History. This was the greatest killer of civilians uh, right through the, most of the last century. Influenza, the flu epidemic of 18, uh, 18, 18, 19 is the one, I'm sorry, 1918, 1919 is the one we think of, but there have been uh, epidemics of influenza before. This was just before the turn of the century uh, distribution following those lines. In 1918, influenza appears, late 1918, influenza appears. It is a fatal disease. It spreads exceedingly rapidly through the world through terrific impact on world populations, as many as 50 million, some people think as many as 100 million, died as a consequence of that. It is called the Spanish flu. I'm not sure why, well, I, I think I know why, but we'll talk about that in a minute. As near as we can tell, the first case of Spanish flu in the world was a mess cook named Albert Gitchell in March 1918 in Funston, Fort Funston, Kansas, uh, that disease, his disease, spread rapidly through the forts uh, that were training soldiers for, for the First World War, spread rapidly through the ports of embarkation, and spread rapidly into, uh, into Europe, and ended up killing uh, tens of millions of people, all, uh, all after uh, Albert Gitchell's misfortune. There's questions as to why it happened in, in Kansas, and some answers we get is because of the pig farms in Kansas, the disease left and made the species jump from pigs to people. Alternatively, uh, Kansas lies under the flyway of, uh, I think, 17 different migrating species of birds. So maybe it was a bird flu that, that made that leap. In any case, it's pretty clear that Spanish flu was not Spanish at all. It came from the United States. This is a plot of, of the disease against the timeline of World War I. It erupts first in the spring of 1918. The words there are not lethal. It's completely correct. It was not uh, as, as vastly lethal, as, as dangerous as it would appear uh, in the fall of 1918 when uh, the death rates were very, very high uh, with terrific effect. One reason for the swift spread of influenza then is, of course, the beginning of the war the concentration of troops from various states, from various places, all living together in very confined space, all exchanging uh, diseases and other conditions with one another. This will give you some idea of the concentration. Uh, here is an improvised hospital facility for flu sufferers. You've seen things like this in, in modern news today for uh, the current virus. Uh, down in the bottom left are the police of Philadelphia getting ready to go out on their rounds. And if it's any comfort to you, it's pretty clear that face masks, in the case of influenza epidemics, go back at least a century. All sorts of explanations for what this three-day fever was, and how to be careful, uh, how to take care of yourself, keep out of crowds and stuffy places, places that were well aired, spend time out of doors each day, walk to work if you can. Make every possible effort to breathe as much pure air as possible. It sounds not unfamiliar to us who are living through 
of COVID-19. There's some statistics on uh, death rates. Uh, the illness attack rate is red. The mortality rate is black by age group and populations. And what's striking about the influenza was it, uh, it was fatal, lethal to uh, age group that typically is not subjected uh, so harshly to disease. That is 18 and, uh, and up to 42 year olds. This is a distribution curve of mortality in, in America and Europe. Deaths expressed as annual rates, as they say, somewhere between 50 and 100 a million people died. We see a continuation of all these uh, conditions, uh, new, new strains of flu, HIV, MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, SARS, and other respiratory syndrome. What's happening is these diseases are being passed back and forth from one species to another, from it's in the wet markets of China, from bats in, in the forests of, of, uh, of Africa. All this contact between different species are passing diseases. These diseases mutate at the rate of a generation every 30 minutes. And the consequences of that are they adapt very, very quickly to new hosts and to new conditions. Interesting book by Laurie Garrett on it called The Coming Plague. Uh, the newly emerging diseases in the world out of balance. Congo River Basin is, is a source for all kinds of, of uh, disease exports. This arrow gives you an idea that most famously uh, Ebola is a, a fever that comes out of the Congo. That distribution map on the right shows you that. And here are some other uh, illustrations of the distribution and the presence of Ebola outbreaks through Central Africa. The outbreak, most recent outbreak was 2018, uh, through again through Central Africa, displacing a million people and horrific suffering. <laughs> this will tell you a little bit about Ebola and the democracy. In Eastern Congo, we have the second largest Ebola outbreak. It is not contained. It is spreading. Over 3,000 cases reported of Ebola. We had over 2,000 fatalities. Two thirds of the cases have passed away. Probably the numbers that we have are only half of the true level of the outbreak. If we hadn't been able to vaccinate 170,000 people, this would have been a full runaway outbreak by now. This is in a densely populated region, North Kivu and Ituri, eight and a half million people. Now, new cases in the large hub of Goma, two million people, lots of air links and lots of road links. However, two therapies that can cure Ebola have now been proven to be effective in clinical field trials. If taken early, these treatments are 90% effective at curing Ebola. Pretty extraordinary. We now have science defending us from diseases that had horrific fatality rates uh, as recently as, as decades or, or two or three ago. Cholera, we still have cholera in the world, uh, brought to uh, Haiti, we think, by Nepalese soldiers as part of the occupation, a group that went to Haiti. Uh, that uh, disease dehydrates people to the point of fatality. What, what makes our world successful in the face of all these conditions was just a century ago or two centuries ago, we saw children dying as they did on that, on that tombstone I showed you when I began this lecture. What makes this work is the development of modern medicine through effective vaccines. I make no secret of the fact that I'm a vaccine enthusiast. I know that this is a contentious subject and the president mystifies me. Uh, if you look on my website, or if you look at this presentation again, you'll see these titles talking about the development of vaccination, the role of vaccination in, in modern medicine, and its social implications, social consequences. I urge you to read them and inform yourself. Finally, the last book in the last minute I'll talk about is Empire of Pain, an enormously interesting book by Patrick Keefe. It is the secret history of the Sacred Dynasty subtitle. What he's talking about, of course, is opioids, opioid, opioid abuse, and the consequences of drug addiction, opioid addiction on society in, in the United States and elsewhere. It's medical, it's, it's as well a, a whodunit kind of thing.
uh, I invite it to your attention as a book uh, of great significance and great interest. I'll end by saying one of the things that concerns us is that by indiscriminate use of antibiotics in modern medicines, uh, we are introducing those medicines, those antibiotics into the world, and the result will be the development of immunity on the part of some of the diseases that we're trying to manage. Tuberculosis is one of them. There are varieties of tuberculosis that are immune to the initial disease, uh, medicines that we use to treat them. That's scary. We indiscriminate in our use of antibiotics, we're going to find that they no longer are effective in the control of disease. Uh, this is the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, the one in the back is pestilence, the you know, white riding a pale horse. Uh, it's a great painting by Viktor Vaznetsov. Uh, and it concludes uh, my presentation to you. I'm grateful for your time and attention. Think about disease, think about history, and please uh, take a look at uh, at the books that I've suggested. Uh, if you didn't copy them down as we went along, as I say, they're listed on my website. I've enjoyed talking with you. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. And over to you at the library. All right, thank you very much for that. Uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll get to a few questions. Um, while we're waiting for those to come in, I actually have a question. I'm referring to the books that you put up at the beginning of the presentation that you say are on your website. Um, there were two on the 1918 influenza uh, epidemic, the one by John Barry and the one by Gina Colada. If someone was looking to- Gina Colada. Yeah. If you were, if one was look, um, if someone was looking to start with one of those, could you just briefly discuss the difference between their approaches to the influenza pandemic? Uh, the information is quite similar. Gina's approach, the way she writes, is a little bit more accessible, and and I would suggest that is a good place to begin. Both of these are dated, but uh, the, the issues they're addressing, the disease they're addressing, uh, uh, there's not a lot of change there. So either one of those is equally good. Both of them should be uh, available to you, uh, either electronically or even in paper copy. And I invite you um, uh, examining one or the other uh, indiscriminately. They're both they're both good books. Thank you for that. We are getting a lot of comments that this was a wonderful presentation and everyone found it very, very interesting. So thank you very much. I, I have to say, I agree with all of those uh, thoughtful people. It's kind of them to have sacrifice part of their afternoon. Uh, and I'm, I appreciate their interest. I enjoy doing this and I welcome the invitation and the attention. Well, it doesn't look like there are any questions coming in. Okay. And so I'm going to hand it over to Alexandra. And thank you. Recorded and will be posted. Those who um, were unable to get in or uh, wanted to listen to again, it will be made available to you. And I would like to thank you, Mr. Jempoler, for a wonderful um, program. It's, it's extremely interesting and rather um, timely, given what we've been through the last year. And uh, I look forward to having you speak here again, hopefully in the near future in person. That would be fun. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, in the interim, did any questions come in? It looks like we're waiting on one question. Somebody says they have one. So if you could just send that in. They are sending it in as we speak. While we're waiting, I'm looking at this uh, painting of the four horsemen. That's, that's really pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. There's a, a book called Pale Horse, Pale Rider. Oh yeah, uh, you can you can see where the title came from. Just looking at the last last of these horses. Did you have fun putting this together? Yes. 
Um, and, and one of the things that I, I have a fairly large uh, catalog of these because we've been lecturing on cruise ships for many years. Uh, I should tell you that about a year ago, the last, no more, a year and a half ago, uh, one of the managements of the cruise ship companies I was with asked me not to give this lecture. <laughs> I think it was settling their uh, passengers, they thought. It surprised me because many passengers on those cruise ships are physicians retired or still active. And uh, they were all enthusiastic about it. But I said, sure, we'll, we'll go on to other things we can talk about. And my guess is uh, the industry saw itself in a very difficult situation uh, as, uh, as the numbers started to come in as to, as to the epidemic and, uh, and consequently backed off any discussion of disease of any description in history. Well, then they also had the Norova virus too as a problem yeah. on those tours. So I could see where they might not want to. So the question came in, it is whether you have looked into or done a presentation on, and you mentioned it a little bit uh, today, but whether you've done a presentation that focuses very specifically on how disease directly impacted history, such as the growth of anti-Semitism and the persecution of women as witches. Um, so a presentation that focuses specifically on that instead of the history of disease overall. No, and as close as I got to that was women and witches. You remember the ergot poisoning. Um, no, uh, it would be fascinating to do that. I think I have 20, 25 lectures in, in the catalog that you'll see at the website. Uh, I'm not eager to find another, but that would be that would be an inter <laughs> interesting expansion of this subject, and, and I appreciate the suggestion. <laughs> well, you'll have to give Patty credit because it was her idea. <laughs> Good for you, Patty. Okay. Well, those are all the questions. Thank you very much. I enjoyed Thank it. You. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. We look forward to seeing you again in person at the library, maybe next year. That would be great. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.